Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for hosting this meaningful session at this important forum. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to introduce our speakers in this parallel session. I will begin uh, with the person sitting on my left. So seen from your uh, view, it'll be uh, people from the right. So we have Ambassador Lee Soo Hoon. He was formerly a presidential advisor on Northeast Asian issues. And for a long time, he was teaching students at a university. And so in terms of theory and practice, he is a well-versed person. And he was also former ambassador to Japan. And we appreciate that he is here with us despite his busy schedule. Our next speaker is Akiba. Tada Toshi, who is an advisor of the Japan Congress Against A&H Bombs and former mayor of Hiroshima. He is in Hiroshima right now. He couldn't come here in person, but we are connected with him online. So I will be introducing him again right before his presentation. And beside him is Professor Hosaka Yuji of Sejong University. He is currently the director of the Tokdo Research Institute, and he is teaching Japan studies to his students at Sejong University. And he's one of the leading experts on Korea-Japan relations. And with the young people here in Korea and anyone interested in our relations with Japan, uh, he has been meeting with them because he's one of the most prominent uh, leaders and experts in this field. So thank you for being here with us today. And beside the professor, Yuji is uh, former president of Chuncheon National University of Education, Park Min Su. And former President Park majored in humanities, but he has been focused on a lot of research activities, and he's had uh, written many books and articles. He's also a poet and has written many books. So I'd like to introduce to you President Park Min Su who will be reciting a poem that he has written uh, for us today in a short while. So thank you very much, President Park. Our next panelist is Park Yong suk professor at Kangwon National University. And uh, she majored in uh, constitutional law. And so today we'll be uh, talking a lot about uh, the Constitution, particularly the Japanese Constitution. And she also uh, researched at Kyushu University on the constitutional studies. So she will be giving her presentation from a constitutional perspective on the situation here in Korea and in Japan. So thank you very much for your participation. So I have briefly introduced to you our speakers and panelists in this session. And there is one more person who really wanted to be here in person, but due to unavoidable circumstances, he was not able to come physically, but he is connected online. Professor Kim Jae-han uh, of Hallim University. So he studied at Johns Hopkins University, received his PhD in law there and in the ministry of uh, he worked on many projects he was a scholar selected by the ministry of education as well as uh, other international institutions so he is currently teaching at halim university and is also the director of the international affairs or international studies and there was a dmz uh, Congress or, or conference that Professor Kim Jae-han had hosted. So I believe he is indeed uh, one of the leaders and uh, the leading experts with regards to the DMZ-related issues in Korea. 
and he has received a lot of recognition. He has received the DMZ Peace Award for his efforts in this area. Although he is not connected, he is not with us physically. We will be hearing from him online uh, later on. We are still experiencing a lot of uh, difficult circumstances, but we have a uh, full participation from our speakers and panelists, so we really appreciate that. And we are still uh, in the midst of the pandemic, and we are experiencing a transformation in human civilization. And in the order, in the post-corona or post-COVID international order, we are bound to experience much change. It is under this circumstance that we are having this very important forum. Of course, it would have been uh, much better if we could have no masks on, if we could meet face to face. Uh, and yet, we are trying to overcome the current circumstances, uh, and we are still trying to engage in good discussions. And I believe that these efforts will contribute to a more stability and peace in Northeast Asia. There is past, present, and future. So we need to learn from the lessons of the past. And based on those lessons, we need to find the wisdom for peaceful coexistence more than ever. As you are well aware, when you look at human history, there have been many wars, small and big. In the early 20th century, there was the first, second world wars and the Korean War. And the result of a war is devastating for both the winners and the losers of the war. As a remnant of the Second World War, the Japanese pacifist constitution was formed. So it was a message of peace, that they, a re resolution that there will no more be wars waged by the country. And this pacifist constitution uh, shows that peace, this is an important pillar for peaceful coexistence here in Northeast Asia. The result of the Korean War is still ongoing. We have the DMZ existing, and we still uh, are in a state of armistice. And uh, since the armistice was formed, the ecology in the DMZ has been preserved. And now many people are seeing hope of peace here in the DMZ region. And we should learn from the past history and uh, learn the lessons to ensure that we will not repeat the past mistakes of war. And so, in that respect, the remnants of war should be changed to symbols of peace. In particular, the Korean DMZ and the Japanese pacifist constitution should be made into legacies of peace. And that is the purport of our session today. I did mention in my introduction, but our speakers and panelists in this session are, again, the people who have been researching on peace and have been practicing and implementing uh, peace efforts in their respective areas. So we have the most prominent uh, experts in this field with us today, which uh, makes me feel very proud and very happy to be moderating this session. So as for how we will proceed today in our program, we'd like to begin with the first presentation by Ambassador Lee Soo Hoon to talk about the overall uh, international political situation in the Northeast Asian region. And based on his presentation, we will listen to the video message by video presentation by Akiba Tadatoshi, former mayor of Hiroshima. And I'll be introducing him again right before his presentation. So let us begin with presentation by Ambassador Lee Suhun. Very nice to meet you all. It is a great pleasure to join 
Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2021. And it's also a pleasure to be part of this session. Once again, I'm very happy to be a part of this session under the title From the Remnants of War to the Symbols of Peace. As was mentioned by our moderator, this session is to deal uh, with uh, Japan's pacifist constitution as well as Korea's DMZ. I'm not a legal expert, uh, nor do I have knowledge on the constitution, uh, but the reason why I was invited as a speaker, I believe, is uh, because of my interest in the peace in Northeast Asia. And not only that, I was the inaugural ambassador uh, to Japan for Korea. And uh, in very challenging circumstances, I did do my best to mend the ties with Japan. So with regard to uh, the Japan's uh, stance uh, and peace and peace uh, in Northeast Asia, I think I can share some of my ideas and thoughts. As you are very well aware, the Peace Constitution of Japan uh, was put together in the process of liquidating or settling uh, the war, and I'm sure that you are very well aware of that fact. Right after the Pacific War, with the U.S. at the lead, it was, uh, of course, their initiative. So according to the vision of the U.S., Japan uh, was to be transformed into a war-renouncing nation or a peace nation. Under this principle, uh, this peace constitution was uh, put together. As you are very well aware, the peace constitution of Japan, particularly Article 9, indicates war renunciation and denial of any war funding. In other words, armaments are all denied and the right of belligerency is also denied under Article 9. These three items are key items in this uh, pacifist constitution. Article 9 has to do with universal pacifism as well as uh, peace policy and peace vision. But there is also another point to note. This uh, pacifist constitution is not something that's confined to Japan. Of course, it impacts the peace and security of the Japanese. However, it's not confined to that. At the time, the U.S. was trying to build regional order in East Asia. And the U.S. intended to make Japan into a peaceful nation and have them as their regional partner to establish order in North in East Asia. So there was uh, this big picture that was built by the U.S. So the pacifist constitution is not only the constitution of Japan. It's a constitution that also impacts the people of East Asia. And Japan, with this uh, peace constitution, uh, was able to flourish under the sponsorship and support of the U.S. throughout the Cold War years. They rely their security on U.S. on the U.S. and they focus on economic revival that has led to a great success. But it wasn't only Japan that flourished during the years under this pacifist constitution and with a peaceful Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong, and all of these East Asia miracle countries were able to achieve their miracles under such a system. This miracle was possible due to uh, the U.S. Uh, hegemony as well as Japan's the partnership that Japan that the U.S. had with Japan. Uh, this all enabled the miracle of East Asia with Japan at the lead. So we had Japan at the lead, uh, and Korea and Taiwan and other smaller economies to follow. 
and those efforts were brought together to position East Asia as a key pillar on the world stage. So the pacifist constitution of Japan, as well as the U.S.'s intent to build East Asian order with Japan as a partner, all had an impact. So this reality was possible because Japan went down the path of, path of pacifism. But in addition to such path, I would also like to indicate uh, the policy or theory of small nation. The small nation theory is uh, as follows. When Japan was uh, putting together its peaceful constitution, uh, there was an ideological uh, tradition that was focused on freedom and people's rights movements. Uh, there were scholars uh, that upheld the ideals of freedom and people's rights movement, which led to a small nation theory. And this is an important concept in my talk. What is the small nation theory? Small nation theory is all about uh, refraining from external expansion and expanding the scope of influence. The small nation theory or policy has to do with coexistence and cooperation amongst Asian countries. In other words, Japan, ever since uh, World War II, the Pacific War, and uh, it was focused on aggression and expansion and invasion in the past, but this trajectory is the other way around. Small nation policy or small nation theory is embedded in the pacifist constitution, and I believe we need to pay keen attention to this theory. I will be elaborating further on in the latter part of my talk, but this small nation policy in the East Asian region is critical because it holds uh, the powers pursuing hegemony in check, whether it be China or whether it be other powers. In East Asia, there were many unfortunate situations arising from the powers pursuing hegemony. So holding these powers in check uh, is also an important ideal in the pacifist constitution. And then time passed. And now, what is it like in East Asia? Let me now talk about the regional order that we see here today. These days, uh, there's a lot of say on the current situation with, where uh, now it's a hegemonic rivalry between the U.S. and China. The East Asian region has now become an arena of competition between the U.S. and China. So, the U.S. currently has a uh, hegemony and well in the past it was the US's hegemony with Japan as its partner but this system no longer stands this has collapsed because uh, we've seen a decline in US's hegemony and we've also witnessed the emergence of China and this decline and emergence has led to making East Asia as mentioned an arena of competition between the two powers of US and China these two majors are vying for hegemony, and this has led to impacting East Asian countries. They are stressed out and they are perplexed right now. Japan also is very much different from the past. No longer is it a peaceful nation. Uh, its ideals of a peaceful nation has been scarred. And I'm sure you all heard about the normal nation, particularly under the Abe administration. Uh, Japan has stated that they are now a normal nation, meaning that they can go to war. A normal nation means that uh, it will no longer renounce war. But what is a peace constitution? It's about renouncing war. It's about uh, not acknowledging and denying any sort or form of war, but all of this ideal or the concept, the values have been scarred in the process. Japan, as a normal nation, has already made a lot of progress down this path. 
this is the reality that we are witnessing today. I've mentioned that Article 9 stipulates that any war funding and armament is denied. However, throughout the years, Japan has focused on militarization under the acquiescence and consent of the U.S. It went down the path of militarization. Even now, uh, they've been uh, engaging in significant military spending. And as a result, uh, Japan has been transformed into a fifth military power of the world. Korea, of course, has been focused on militarization. Uh, it is sixth, uh, according to research. Uh, but at any rate, well, Japan and also Korea, we've been in pursuit of peace. However, there's a lot of military spending ongoing in both of these countries. And if I may go back to the topic of the pacifist constitution, it's now going down that path of a normal nation. And because of these actions, uh, the pacifist constitution is under great threat. I mentioned uh, that East Asia is now a, a area of competition of the U.S. and China, and the countries surrounding and neighboring are stressed out. And what about Korea? It's the same. Uh, we are perplexed as well. We're baffled. We have to see what U.S. thinks, what China thinks. Sometimes we may have to follow the policy of the U.S., but then shall we also follow China? So they, we are have many choices to make. So you can see that this is a major factor of worry, and there are cases where we need to make inevitable choi choi uh, choices. In 2017, in Gyeongbuk Songju, uh, the thought was deployed, and China said they will be severing all relations, including tourism as well as trade. There was major economic retaliation, and it suf Korea suffered a great blow in the process, and we all do remember the challenging times due to THAAD. And in South China, uh, in South China Sea, the U.S. and China have been engaging in discord, and uh, there is also a threat of this escalating into an armed conflict. Uh, there are all of these different sides and arguments leading to much discord and conflict. And when we do see this discord or conflict between these two powers, it makes our spot quite difficult because we have U.S. troops in Korea. If there are any uh, armed confrontations between the U.S. and China, then it may lead uh, China, uh, the U.S. to mobilize U.S. troops in Korea to the site. So then if that does happen, what will China do? China will not tolerate such a situation. Therefore, the order in East Asia right now is very much different from the past of where we had the U.S. hegemony and a partnership with Japan. Japan decided uh, to go against from their existing peace constitution and also uh, the Article 9 of the Constitution on war renunciation has been greatly scarred and harmed, and Japan is now going that path of becoming a normal nation that can go to war uh, if intended. So this is quite explicit right now, and as you are all very well aware, Prime Minister Abe is trying to amend uh, Article 9. A constitutional amendment was a main major agenda item that was argued uh, throughout his term. That was uh, his political will and move. So today, this uh, pacifist constitution is under threat, and we need to pay attention to this. We are seeing hegemonic competition between the U.S. and China, and the we are negatively impacted. The everyday life of our Koreans are being impacted, and if we even look at uh, the order of East Asia, what's in store for us? 
What kind of direction will Japan take? What will happen to their Pacific Constitution? What kind of future uh, will they decide to um, create? Uh, will be a key determining factor. Depending on their decision, a major change can be foreseen in East Asia in the order of East Asia. So there, the people of East Asia want and pursue peace, and it would be great if Japan does go down that path. However, uh, their efforts to amend the Pacific Constitution about doing away with certain clauses and articles in the Constitution uh, may impact uh, the order of the region. So the competition between the U.S. and China, along with Japan's stance and actions, will all be brought together to negatively impact East Asia. So I want to once again emphasize that the decision Japan makes on the Pacific Constitution uh, will be critical. And let us now look at the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we may think that we are at a very peaceful state, but in theory, it's still an armistice. We haven't been able to put an end to the war. So this armistice system is still ongoing. So there is this instability coming from the structural situation of the peninsula, and we can call this a vulnerable uh, form of peace. We don't know when this will break because we haven't been declaring the end of war. So that's why many do say, and especially the Moon Jae-in administration is trying to find a way to go for a declaration of end of war. Uh, so if we do see instability on the Korean Peninsula, what would it be for the U.S. and North? They weren't able to normalize ties. Uh, there was confrontation and hostilities going back and forth. And what about Japan? We see, once again, confrontation and hostility between Japan and DPRK. And the Korean Peninsula peace process is to normalize all of these ties and relations. And in 2018, oh, we had uh, Pyeongchang uh, Winter Olympics in 2018. It was the Olympics of Peace, and it kick-started the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. Afterwards, of course, there were certain achievements. Uh, we had uh, the Inter-Korean Summit. Uh, there were some key agreements. And not only that, for the first time in history, we had the summit between the confrontational powers. Uh, we had the heads of the U.S. and DPRK uh, to meet three times, as well as hold summits, and this is a significant achievement. Uh, some may ask, was there anything that we were able to gain from that? But uh, regardless of that, the fact that, that they met, I think, carries significant meaning. So at any rate, the Korean Peninsula peace process went to that point. But if you look back, Japan was not at all involved in this process. Of course, uh, this has to do with uh, the sour relationship Japan has with DPRK. However, the Korean Peninsula peace process uh, cannot only be achieved with dialogue between the two Koreas and the U.S. and DPRK. If we want some visible outcome in, in East Asia, uh, this will not be enough. The participation of Japan here is critical. Uh, the denuclearization peace process is something that can be done only when Japan is involved. Uh, it's uh, possible that Japan may be disrupting uh, this process. And in 2018, that really was the case. Uh, they weren't constructive at all because they were excluded in the process. And uh, we saw them negating this process. However, uh, DPRK and uh, the U.S. 
if, let's say, they do normalize relations and have a, a U.S. representative in Pyongyang, uh, unless we have Japan as a part of the process, it's uh, highly likely that they will be strongly opposing this idea. Therefore, I want to once again emphasize that Japan needs to be a part of the Korean Peninsula peace process. And if that is not the case, this process will not be able to drive any substantial outcome. Uh, the Korean government in the remaining tenure uh, will be and uh, will be striving to uh, pursue dialogue. And I think that we need to find a way to mend relations with Japan as well, to have them on board when dealing with uh, the North Korean issues. And only when we do have Japan engaged can we see some concrete results from the Korean Peninsula peace process. And we also need to find a way to recover relations between Japan and DPRK. There's the kidnapping issues, and there were some negotiations to normalize relations, but this has been all severed. So they do have some pending issues right now. But all of these issues also need to be resolved to have the Korean Peninsula peace process uh, bear any fruit. The upholding the pacifist uh, constitution and especially Article 9 that we do have Japanese and Koreans trying to find a way to protect and uphold Article 9. We have many people in East Asia that are trying to find a peaceful solution. Uh, they want peaceful order, uh, something that goes against uh, military might, but uh, only that of peace, because uh, this enables stable peace and security and prosperity in their region. So once again, Japan uh, needs to be a part uh, and needs to play a role in bringing peace in East Asia. So we need to request them to play that role and we need to have dialogue and uh, with uh, the important officials and scholars, we need to engage in further dialogue to make this possible. And with that, let me conclude. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, e former Ambassador Lee Soo Hoon has uh, given us some insightful comments. So at the end of the day, uh, the pacifist constitution was something that protected uh, peace and order in East Asia, and it had symbolic meaning in East Asia. However, this pacifist constitution is under threat, according to his comments. And if we do see a collapse of this constitution, we may be seeing an arms race, uh, which will be very challenging. So the participation of Japan uh, is critical in this Korean Peninsula peace process. So that was the gist of his uh, presentation. And according to or following the program, although he's not here in person, we have uh, someone joining us from Japan. Mr. Akiba Tadatoshi, former mayor of Hiroshima. So we'll be listening to his video presentation first. And as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Akiba Tadatoshi was a former member of the uh, Japanese Diet and was a former mayor of Hiroshima. And he was also a leading uh, peace-related groups. And one thing I want to share with you is that he actually majored in mathematics. He's a mathematician. And so he has written a book uh, on reading the Japanese constitution as if it were a math book. So now I would like to listen to his presentation. And in my moderation today, I did mention earlier but what I do want to repeat is that each speaker will be given about 15 minutes for their presentations. And after we listen to all of the speakers' presentations, we'd like to go on right away to the uh, general discussion session. And in the middle of uh, or during the presentations, 
Former President Park Min Su uh, will be sharing another poem with us, uh, a poem that he has written uh, with us later on. So if the staff is ready, we'd like to show you the presentation, video presentation of Akiba Tadatoshi. Hello, my name is Tadatoshi Akiba. I'm an advisor to the Japanese anti-nuclear group called Genseikin and the former mayor of Hiroshima. Thank you for allowing me to speak about the Japanese constitution and its potential contributions to world peace. Please let me abbreviate the Japanese constitution as JC since the expression appears many times during this speech. You have chosen the right person because I wrote a book on the constitution called Reading the Japanese Constitution as if it were a math book, published by Hosei University Press two years ago. The book's main thrust is to read the JC as literally and logically as possible without relying on outside sources to justify its interpretation. Although this attitude is at the basis of my reading of the JC, what I would like to call your attention to today is the pacifism in it. Many of us living in Japan and many outside believe that the preamble and Article 9 of the Japanese constitution could play an essential role in creating peace. Some have even nominated them for the Nobel Peace Prize. Of course, they are not human and the prestigious prize's relevance may not be evident to everyone. However, Article 9 represents pacifism, which is one of the three pillars of the Japanese constitution the other two being the basic human rights and popular sovereignty. Today, I wish to shed new light on the JC. I want to portray the JC as a starting point of a new paradigm that would lead us to a world without war. To start my brief effort, the first thing I must do is to present preamble of the JC and Article 9. Preamble and we have determined to preserve our security and existence, trusting in the justice and faith of the peace-loving peoples of the world. That's the end of the quote. Article 9. Aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. Two, in order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. The end of quote. Peace appears in the real world, world in many different forms and shapes. However, over centuries and millennia, as well as within a relatively short period from 1945 to the present, the world has become less violent and more peaceable. That is the main thesis of the 800-page book by Professor Steven Pinker of Harvard University. I agree wholeheartedly. For example, in Japan, warlords ruling their dominions fought each other to expand their territories. The span of 140 years between the mid-15th century to the early 17th century is known as the period of warring states. When Ieyasu Tokugawa established the new shogunate in Edo, present Tokyo, that is, wars within Japan ceased. The shift from the days of constant wars to no internal war is a typical case of the Leviathan transformation from violence to nonviolence. In the middle of the 19th century, when Japan emerged from its isolation period that lasted more than 200 years, Japan became one of the world's active and aggressive warring states. The picture of the world consisting of adversarial, even not warring states, is a globalized version of Japan in the 15th and 16th centuries. If it describes the contemporary world situation, 
Many argue that one possible scenario toward a world without war is to globally realize Japan's Leviathan transformation in the early 17th century. To carry out this kind of radical transformation, we need a global counterpart playing the role of the Tokugawa shogunate or a Leviathan. It could be a world government, an advanced form of the United Nations, or something we would create in due course. I also need to emphasize that it should embody such values as democracy, human rights, and creativity that the human race has thus far upheld as axioms of our existence. Now I'm adding the preamble and Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution to those axioms that define the new paradigm. I want to show you that this is a good idea by comparing the Japanese Constitution with the Korean Constitution and the American Constitution. I extract three ingredients from the standard existing constitutions, that is the latter two Korean and American constitutions, that give the current paradigm a definite shape. Ingredient 1. Military preparedness against foreign adversaries. Ingredient 2. Preparedness against the destruction of democracy and popular sovereignty by the political authority. Ingredient 3. The moral basis for the legitimacy of the current constitution abstracted from the previous two ingredients. These ingredients re represent the current paradigm because they weave the following story. The world consists of countries that could wage war against each other. You must prepare for it by installing the armed forces. The Leviathan that rules a country has the possibility of oppressing people and depriving them of democracy and popular sovereignty. One must prepare for it, even by radical means. Since many countries gained independence by resorting to these procedures, and since the world is still at the same stage, the first two ingredients guarantee the legitimacy of the current constitution and remain the staple of maintaining national existence in today's world. Let me call this paradigm the adversarial model. To understand the adversarial model more accurately, we want to see the three ingredients in action in our OK and the USA's constitutions. First, let us examine the Republic of Korea's constitution because it explicitly expresses these three ingredients. Let me quote uh, the preamble and it is sufficient to convince you. We, the people of Korea, proud of our resplendent history and traditions dating from time immemorial upholding the cause of Provisional Republic of Korea government born of the March 1st independence movement of 1919 and the democratic ideals of the April 19th uprising of 1960 against injustice, having assumed the mission of democratic reform and peaceful unification of our homeland and having determined to consolidate national unity with justice. It is not necessary to point out which is which. Still, the reference to the March 1st independence movement of 1919 implies that preparedness against the adversary is in place. Of course, it refers to Korea gaining independence from the invader, Japan. Article 39 requiring AOK citizens to have the duty of national defense under the conditions as prescribed by law and Article 5.2 stipulating that the armed forces shall be charged with the sacred mission of national security and the defense of the land and the political neutrality shall be maintained, provide more specific means by which to execute the preparedness. The second part of Article 5, that is 2, their political neutrality shall be maintained, is a recipe that buttresses ingredient 2. The inclusion of the democratic ideals of the April 19th uprising of 1960 constitutes ingredient two. Both are historical accounts of ROK and therefore form 
ingredient three. Next, the constitution of the USA is unique in its emphasis on militia. It appears in section eight, but amendment two shows why. The United States gained independence due to the American militia taking arms against the British tyranny. Amendment 2. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. One can interpret the use of militia in the U.S. Constitution that the Americans consider their independence as one from the tyrannical domestic authority rather than a foreign invasion. Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution describes the place and roles of the militia. I do not quote the relevant clauses because they are technical and too long. Simultaneously, conflict with foreign powers uh, were a significant threat to the U.S. and preparedness was essential in its survival. The preamble is satisfactory proof. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. The end of quote. Section 8 describes in detail the power of Congress to organize and maintain the military. Again, the point is unmistakable without quoting from the Constitution. These provisions satisfy the condition of both ingredient 1 and 2 as well as 3. Now we see that both the Korean and American constitutions typify the adversarial paradigm. However, there are provisions in the Korean constitution that break the boundary between the current paradigm and the new one. For example, Article 5.1 reads as follows. The Republic of Korea shall endeavor to maintain international peace and shall renounce all aggressive wars. This conclusion that Korea has reached shows that Korea has not chosen the path of retaliation. Instead, it has chosen to follow the Confucian silver rule. Do not do to others what you would not want done to yourself. Thus, it is breaking out of the current paradigm and entering the new one. The Japanese constitution goes a step further. It renounces war and declares that the nation would not maintain land, sea, and air forces as well as other war potential. Also, there is one more statement that distinguishes the JC from the adversarial model. The preamble states that Japan does not see the world as consisting of adversarial countries. Japan's view is a logical conclusion of the phrase, trusting in the justice and faith of the peace-loving peoples of the world. The JC supports this idea by renouncing war and the military. In the worst case scenario, Japan would be vulnerable to attacks from foreign countries if the assumption of trust in the preamble is breached. This fact shows the firmness of the Japanese commitment. Just as the Korean constitution adopted the silver rule, so did the JC adopted the same rule in the same way. It would not invade other countries. And it went further, it will not own military forces even to defend itself. Does this mean that Japan has recognized, repented, and come to pledge it would never repeat the mistake it had made during its 15-year war in Asia and the Pacific? Many in Japan believe so. You may not agree, but one important point we need to focus on is the pledge of not repeating the past mistakes. It may take a little more time for the Japanese government and hardliners to face the reality of history, but as long as the pledge is intact, no future repetition would occur. Unfortunately, the Japanese government has been trying to revise the JC so that this pledge would be nullified. This is the danger we face today. 
To avoid such a possibility, we must make sure that the Japanese government would not dare revise the Constitution, especially Article 9. Since pacifism in the JC is the starting point of the new paradigm, encouraging the Japanese government to keep Article 9 as is would be good for the world. For this purpose, we need the understanding, cooperation, and encouragement of the world. Nice the Japanese government to lead the world with Article 9 as the symbol of a new paradigm. That, in the end, would help us lead the Japanese government away from the re revision of the Constitution. Thank you for your attention. So that was the presentation by Mr. Akiba Tadatoshi in Japan, the former mayor of Hiroshima. He talked about or he compared the Japanese constitution with that of Korea and the US, as well as the current situation in Japan. So we'd like to now uh, take a moment to breathe. We'll have a short break. And we'll be listening to former President Park Min Su and his recitation of a poem which he has written particularly for this event. So, President Park, if you're ready, please go ahead with your recitation. And right after the recitation, we will invite Professor Kim Jae-han for his presentation on the DMZ. So first, I would like to ask uh, President Park. Yes, thank you very much. As a poet and as a uh, professor that's been teaching poetry to the students at the university, uh, I find it a great pleasure and honor to share with you my piece of work uh, to find a way to spread peace around the world. So I, there may be some lackings, but I hope you enjoy. The Dream of Humanity, Long Live Peace, uh, Part Min Tzu. Today, all of a sudden, we ask the people of the world, do you want true peace? Towards uh, the far future of freedom and blessing, flying a blue flag, love one another, embrace one another, a march of a true beautiful march together. Do you want uh, the joy of an ever-living memory sung? Let's us look back, the history of our humanity, the devastating war, the tragedy of the bloody internal strife, the disastrous outcry, the great flood of tears, the tears stained with blood and aching memory. And we cry out loud, our humanity, the great owners of our world, look back and know yourself, know your sin, and know your hope and know the grand dream of the world of humanity. Same human, same parents, siblings, same person, same love, and same blessing of human community, the beautiful flag of peace, filling the blue sky, flock of pigeons flapping their wings, the long line of living blessing of thanks, the eternal flutter of freedom, the embrace of burning tears. So we cry out far, far out into the world and to we announce again the flutter of peace, the joy of love, the memories of warming tears, the flutter of warm spring breeze touching every corner of the world, the beautiful history of memories we will realize forever and ever, the devil of devastating greed piled in our house, kick away deep down into the fire and flame thousand fathoms below, love, love, and sincerely love. Cry 
and cry out, sharing our warm hearts with one another, become a forever dream and hope. Let us sing together, embrace throughout the town, be a beautiful gesture, be a never-stopping flow of hot tears, be a sky, green memory, never to be forgotten, be joy, be eternity on this land. All persons of the world, dear hope, dear history, dear dream, dear beautiful flag of peace, dear embrace, uh, dear kiss, and alas, the heavens, eternal blessing, a never withering flap of burning gratitude, tears, never stopping. Oh, the embrace of beautiful love, freedom, joy, a world peace, live on forever and ever. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you're close to 80 as far as I know, but you're like passionate youth uh, crying out, long live peace. Thank you very much. So now, well, let us um, switch gears uh, from the Peace Calm Institution to the DMZ. The next presentation is an armistice, war defeat, and the brand of peace at the DMZ and the Peace Constitution. Professor Kim Jae-han will be giving us this presentation, and as I have briefly mentioned, Professor Kim, with regard to DMZ, is not only at home but in the world is a prominent scholar. Uh, he graduated from SNU and also received a degree, degree from Rochester University of the US in politics, and he has more than 200 dissertations. Uh, the dissertation in JCR uh, out of the SCI uh, papers has uh, the greatest number of citations in political science. So with regard to DMZ, uh, Professor Kim will be sharing his insights, and I believe uh, his thoughts and his ideas will be of great help in bettering our understanding on the DMZ. Professor Kim, uh, you're not here with us today, uh, but uh, you will have 15 minutes, so I'd like to ask you to give us a succinct summary of your presentation. Uh, yes, very nice to meet you all. I am Kim Jae-han as introduced. Uh, I will now share my screen. Yes, uh, Professor, uh, is your screen ready? Is Professor Kim, please proceed. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, so uh, we can hear you. You can begin your presentation. So once again, very nice to meet you. I'm Kim Jae-han, as uh, introduced. When we were beginning the session, the uh, moderator uh, did uh, think that I was absent. However, I was logged on from 3.15, and I also prepared uh, my PPT slides in accordance with the criteria by the host. Uh, I was also part of the rehearsal yesterday, and because of simultaneous interpretation, I did hear that it would be better for me to pace out my presentation, but I've already used about uh, quite a, a lot of my time. and. We still have panelists, so I will try to keep my presentation brief and in lieu of time because we do have other presentations and other panelists to comment. So once again, I'll try to keep my presentation short due to time constraints. Now, the topic of my presentation is Armistice, War Defeat, and the Brand of Peace. Uh, the incident of uh, armistice and war defeat, these are all uh, devastating incidents, but how can this become a brand of peace? First, on the armistice. The armistice uh, is reflected in the existence of DMZ, and war defeat can be translated into this existence of a pacifist constitution. It's not something tangible. However, it's something that's currently running, uh, currently un in operation. Because I don't have a lot of time, I cannot go into all of the specifics, but this uh, uh, is the table of contents. I wanted to first talk about the armistice. Uh, we talk about the armistice quite often. However, uh, to technically speaking, it's the armistice agreement. 
and the DMZ was uh, the fruit of this armistice agreement, and this DMZ is noted to deter uh, war. So the first part was on how to evaluate this armistice agreement, and second was war defeat. I wanted to talk about this particular key word because uh, the results of uh, the war defeat has uh, led to demilitarization as well as uh, uh, democratization. And uh, the Japanese constitution and the DMZ can be compared by looking into the structure of armistice and war defeat. And the third is the brand of peace. How can we find a way to brand this armistice and war defeat? And the specific brand that I want to uphold here is the brand of peace. So how can we uphold and promote peace? And uh, the conclusion that I wanted to draw uh, was that whether it be DMC or peace constitution, it's not a relic of the past. It's something uh, that's with us uh, as a part of our daily life. And we need to take note of that in order for us to really see a promotion of peace in the region and in the world. Uh, so we briefly talked about uh, the armistice uh, and war defeat. So you can see that we have the armistice agreement, but there's also a peace agreement which is closer to peace than war compared to the armistice agreement. And I believe you all agree, so if I may move on. Uh, we have the armistice agreement, the end of war declaration, and the peace agreement. And if you look at history, uh, once uh, after the, uh, the breakout of war, uh, if you look at the process towards peace, there are a number of phases uh, that consist of armistice agreement and of war declaration peace agreement, but there could be a number of combinations. There can be a case where there are no agreements, no declaration, and you can go right to peace, but there could be a case where there was only an armistice agreement or just an end of war declaration. Sometimes there was a, a peace agreement involved. Sometimes it was in phases uh, where it was through a armistice and then an end of war declaration or sometimes from a peace agreement to an end of war declaration. And there were, all, were also cases of two agreements and then the end of war declaration. So it could be very complicated if we look at all of the different modes and combinations. So I hope you can just keep that um, as reference. Next on the DMZ. Uh, this is uh, the article in uh, the Armistice Agreement, so let me skip that. And this is a picture of the DMZ. Uh, it looks a bit different depending on where you see, but uh, there can be a number of functions here with or positive uh, or negative impacts. But uh, the positive impact was that, of course, uh, it was unintended, but it did have uh, help us promote ecological value of the region. And this is on whether it deterred any wars or any conflicts. But I think I'll have to skip these slides. But in the in past history, there were many occurrences of war uh, after an armistice. But if we look at all of the wars in the 20th and 21st century, we do see armistices with DMZs that, that had less occurrences of war. And uh, this also is for your reference. And when we evaluate the DMZ, there are many uh, assessments possible. Uh, the DMZ is a clause of the armistice agreement, uh, the agreement of the Korean Peninsula. But this armistice agreement, uh, in many cases, are in violation. And uh, if you take that lens, uh, then many would say that the armistice was a failure because of the many alleged violations. And so let me skip, skip this as well. Uh, the DMZ uh, ha can be thought as a positive or as a negative. So there are both sides to the ass assessment. And um, here you can see uh, that it did help preserve uh, the ecology, but then there were also certain negative aspects to the DMZ. Uh, 
uh, we just heard the recitation of uh, the poem, but here the DMZ uh, in Korean there is a word or character P, uh, but th this letter P has many meanings, and uh, of course the intention was to make this uh, demilitarized. However, uh, I believe that there is a different way to translate this. It could be a zone of hidden militarization, or a zone of sad militarization, or a zone of slander and militarization because this is using a particular character. This character in Korean um, has many meetings, so it's not just about demilitarization. And the armistice agreement may be a bit farther away from peace versus a peace agreement, but we cannot say that it's uh, anything less of peace compared to a peace agreement. And we do understand that the assessment is that it did deter uh, future wars ever since this our armistice agreement was forged. And the war of defeat typically uh, would lead to demilitarization and demarketization uh, or democratization. Let's take the case of Germany. Uh, Germany, uh, they were defeated. And if you look at the Potsdam Declaration, it's quite explicit that the political principle of occupation of uh, Germany would be denazification, demilitarization, democratization, and disarmament. Uh, Japan as well had some similar principles that were applied. Uh, the Pacific Constitution of Japan was already noted, so I will not go into specifics. So here, this is uh, Article 9, and because of this particular article, we call this a pacifist constitution. It's important to maintain this article for peace in the region. And let's compare uh, DMZ and this peace constitution. Both uh, are the, uh, the relics of war. In other words, the, even after the end of war, there are cases where there is a DMZ. If you look at uh, Germany, even after their defeat, there was a DMZ that was set forth. But typically, the uh, by it's true that they are byproducts of war, and DMZs are typically after a armistice or an end of war. And a peace declaration typically follows uh, the end of war declaration. And if you look at the legal grounds, for the DMZ, it's an armistice agreement, so it's uh, based off of a international law, and the peace constitution typically is noted as domestic law, though so the peace constitution in itself is noted as domestic law. And if you look at uh, the uh, the form of code, uh, the DMZ regulates a particular space or area, and the peace constitution has to do with uh, the areas under jurisdiction of Japan, but basically it's about uh, the principle of running the country. And then if you look at the scope, BMZ has an identified region that was set forth, and the peace uh, constitution uh, is applicable to the entire nation. And the DMZ, as you've seen in the picture in the previous slide, uh, we do see the barbed wire fences. We do see these barricades, and this indicates that this is DMZ. And what about the peace constitution? It's not tangible, but uh, we refer to the legal provisions. And another denominator or common denominator is that it's about preventing hostilities or any act of hostilities. DMZ is to prevent any act of hostility. According to the article, um, the armistice agreement, uh, you cannot um, engage in any sort of uh, gunfight in the DMZ. And the peace constitution has to do with preventing war as well as armaments. And both uh, are quite long standing. That's a similarity for DMZ. It's been in form of armistice where uh, there was no war, no recurrence of war. And uh, this peace constitution has been standing for a very long period of time. There are countries that uh, have a different name to this constitution, but if we look at the time that it stands, probably this is the longest peace constitution existing. And any attempts to nullify 
uh, for the DMZ, you know, there are certain um, people that want to get rid of the DMZ uh, because this is a demarcation line. And uh, for the peace constitution, there are certain extreme uh, right nationalists that want to uh, get rid of this constitution. And there's also a similarity in terms of uh, this peace prize. Uh, DMZ um, was a, the motive behind DMZ Peace Prize. And if you look at the Peace Constitution of Japan, uh, there are attempts made to have it nominated as uh, a Nobel Peace Prize nominee. And uh, the Peace Constitution also was awarded with the DMZ Peace Prize, as was already mentioned. And uh, last but not least is about going for inscription, international inscription. B DMZ is not currently inscribed on the international registrar. However, the areas of P DMZ Yeoncheon and Charwan are already known to be a transfrontier biosphere reserve and inscribed on the UNESCO list. But of course, it's not inside the DMZ, but only the areas bordering the DMZ. And what about uh, the peace constitution? There are efforts being made uh, to engage in nominations into the UNESCO heritage site. So I am going to briefly talk about that and then conclude my presentation. Uh, so the UNESCO inscription is also about branding the heritage. And this uh, is a survey on the brand value of the DMC. You can see that it has ecological value and reunification value, but uh, the, the value that it has with regard to peace is the highest according to survey. And this is uh, the estimated value of Seoul. And if we compare uh, that with the DMZ, it uh, has a value of about 52.8% of uh, the value of or the brand value of Seoul, which is 67 trillion won. And this uh, brand value has been taken advantage of in the process of winning the bid to host the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. I was a part of writing the initial nomination file for the Winter Olympics for Pyeongchang. And before we became a candidate, uh, we first become an applicant. And there is a file that we have to write up and submit to the IOC. And I do remember, it's f quite fresh in my memory, where we had no template or sample. Uh, we've worked with Kangwon province, but at the time there was no sample, there was no template. So what happened was uh, just utilize a creativity, uh, but we focused on the fact that we are a divided nation, that we cannot send letters to our divided families. And then IOC asked, is this a fact? Uh, is this uh, fiction or nonfiction? So you can see that this uh, the separated families, the hurt and the despair, uh, was something that was not well uh, known around the world. And yes, so it's uh, currently a uh, biosphere reserve, but there were some ups and downs in the process. And this is a map of the biosphere reserve. Uh, this is the Kangwon Eco Peace Biosphere Reserve, and this is in the Gyeonggi area. We have these uh, biosphere reserves uh, inscribed on the list. And regarding the peace com um, constitution, as was mentioned in the previous presentations, uh, they talk about the value that it carries, and there were many meanings behind this pacifist constitution. Uh, some say that the DMZ should also win the Nobel Peace Prize, but it's the same case for uh, the peace constitution. But uh, this peace, uh, Nobel Peace Prize, uh, it has a criteria that it cannot be conferred uh, to an object or to an entire population, only an individual. So this in itself cannot be a candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize. However, there are committees that are trying to find a way to have it win the prize. But uh, I think that that in itself, their efforts do carry some significant meaning. Many people try to have it inscribed on the list. And there are many types of heritages under the UNESCO system. We do have uh, the world heritage, the intangible cultural heritage, and the memory of the world. And they are, these are the criteria behind these heritage uh, to have it inscribed on the list, all of the criteria and list. We also have uh, the criteria behind uh, uh, inscribing, get, having it inscribed on the list of ICH and the need of urgent safeguarding. 
And I mentioned uh, that I was uh, I drafted uh, the applicant file uh, for the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. But in many cases, if we focus on a nationalistic perspective, that really did, was not very successful. If you, it was the same case for the Beijing Olympics and any other Olympics. If it's just on well a nationalistic perspective or unification, this it's very difficult to uh, have it heard by uh, IOC. However, if it's a UNESCO heritage, for instance, if it's confined to a certain race or a certain group, um, that's uh, frowned upon. Of course, there are some political powers and forces that do come into play, but this UNESCO inscription is trying to make it as universal as possible. So these are some of the issues that we have to take into account. And because I don't have a lot of time, uh, so re with regard to the UNESCO inscription, the uh, there is this uh, conflict between Japan and Korea on this battleship island or the Hashima coal mine. So this is uh, the conclusion that I want to draw. Uh, you can see that uh, the DMZ and the peace constitution is not a past relic. It is an origin of future value. It's something that it's still that's com that's still in play. So it's not about just conserving the value of uh, these resources. It's uh, about having this noted as an origin of future value. So in lieu of time, I would like to conclude my presentation here. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Professor Kim, I can see that uh, hearing from your presentation, you've actually deepened the discussion of this session. Professor Kim, also put together a uh, academic institute on DMZ, and he won the DMZ Peace Prize. And uh, very true to his prominence and name, he has given us an insightful presentation, and he prepared uh, greatly. He put together this uh, PPT file uh, based on the guidelines offered by the host uh, organizer, but. Uh, Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join us in person, and I would like to apologize for not being able to uh, give you ample time. And uh, of course, all other forums have time constraints, but uh, this uh, session is trying to deal with both the DMZ and the peace constitution, and we need more time. And that's why we had uh, allotted 120 minutes. And uh, Professor Kim, uh, you mentioned that uh, the Nobel Peace Prize cannot be conferred to an individual, uh, cannot be an, an conferred to a non individual. Uh, it should be conferred to a person. And the DMZ, for instance, I think that. Rather than having this as a recipient of a certain prize, there is a lot of effort being made to have it inscribed on the UNESCO list. So is there something that you would like to add on to this or would you like to... Well, I think it's better to have you join us once again in the panel discussion to offer us some more insight. So, Professor Kim, oh, did you hear what I was saying, a summary of your presentation? I think that uh, he lost our audio. Is that the case? <laughs> I believe that Professor Kim cannot hear what we are saying. Yes, Professor Kim, were you able to hear what I was saying? Now I can hear. I think that there was a technical difficulty. So because uh, in lieu of time, I think I cannot repeat myself. But once again, thank you very much for your insightful comments. And thank you so much for that wonderful pres uh, PowerPoint presentation. And I want to apologize for not being able to provide you with ample time to give your presentation. And because we're dealing with the Peace Constitution and DMZ, uh, I We've been allowed 20 additional minutes to have 120 minutes in total. So after all of the presentations, I think you can add some more comments. So now, can you hear what I'm saying? Yes. I would like to ask for your understanding uh, for some technical difficulties. And let us now move on. Our next speaker is 
Professor Hosaka Yuji. He is very popular here in Korea. He has great depth with regards to Korean issues, and he has great affection for Korea. So the realities of Korea as well as of Japan, he's someone who is well-versed on the realities. So, And you've listened to the earlier presentations also. You've heard about the DMZ. So Professor Hosaka Yuchi will now uh, give a presentation from an objective perspective. So you'll be having about 15 minutes for your presentation. Good afternoon. As was just introduced, I am Hosaka Yuji of Sejong University. It's been 32 years since I came to Korea. And in 2003, I was naturalized uh, as a Korean. And so right now, it's just my name that is Japanese. But I am Korean in my citizenship. As for my presentation today, this is actually a very important topic for me. Japan Constitution and Korea DMZ as a peace regime. So that is the title of my presentation. But I wanted to uh, approach this in a more easier manner, to, a manner that is more easy to understand from a historical, from a geopolitical perspective. So first of all, if you look at the policy of Japan towards Korean Peninsula, the basic foreign strategy of Japanese nationalism after Meiji period was the formation of the Korean Peninsula as a buffer zone. And that was the reason behind the colonization of the peninsula. Ultimately, Japan at that time wanted to use the Korean Peninsula uh, as a defense of Japan as well as a, a springboard for invasion of the continent. From the Japanese people's perspective at that time, there was possibility that Russia or the Soviet Union will be attacking Japan. There was that concern. Reversely, at that time, China was being invaded by other countries a lot, and so there was a thought that Japan should participate in that invasion of China. And so Japan has to become an invading country. That was the uh, thought at that time. And so for the defense of Japan, as well as for invasion of other countries, uh, the springboard that Japan will be using is the Korean Peninsula. So prior to that, the Korean Peninsula was under the influence of China. But after that period, it has to fall under the influence of Japan. So after the Meiji modernization period, the Korean Peninsula policy of Japan changed in this direction, and that was the basic keynote in its external policies. So what about the current South Korea or Korean Peninsula policy of Japan? If you look at the details on this slide, you will see that in 2013, the Abe administration developed the National Security Guarantee Strategy. In 1945, after losing in the war, Japan had never announced a national security strategy. However, under the Abe administration, there was an announcement of this security strategy, and there was mention or a section about the Korean Peninsula as well. And if you emphasize it, the South Korea policy of Japan is as follows. Korea is geopolitically important in resolving North Korea and China issues. And so geopolitically, this term means that, in fact, militarily, it is important. So we can equate the two terms. Ultimately, particularly for the far-right groups in Japan, who were the supporters of the Abe administration, from their perspective, the Korean Peninsula geopolitically is of help to Japan in terms of resolving or dealing with the DPRK and China issues. So ultimately, these are military issues. And so Korean Peninsula is needed to resolve these military or geopolitical issues, particularly South Korea is needed for this end. 
From the geopolitical perspective, the Korean Peninsula has always been an area that is sacrificed. And so it's important for us to understand this uh, reality. And so it is from this geopolitical perspective that we need to try to assess the Japanese constitution and the DMZ. So let's now briefly t uh, talk about the major theories of geopolitics. So Halford Mackinder, in his book Geopolitics, defined the world in this manner. So he drew the globe, and Mackinder saw the world as a struggle or a fight between the continental powers and the maritime powers. So that was his official position. A country like the U.S. would be considered as a huge island. So it's not a continent, but it's an island. So since it's an island, it was part of a maritime power. And Japan also is an archipelago, which makes it fall under the sea powers. And for other classifications, because Japan is close to the coastal zones or a rimland area, then it would be considered as a coastal area as well, like um, South Korea. And for continental power, Russia would be an example. McKinder also said that the center of the world is the pivot area, which you see in the middle, Russia, China, and they were about two thirds of uh, these countries. That is the center of the world. That is the pivot area. And all of the strong powers in the world will try to take the pivot area. And that was his view. So rather than uh, it being the truth, I think the perception was more of uh, making strategic choices, strategic decisions. And an American theorist called Nicholas Spikeman developed the Rimland theory or the coastal zone theory. And according to this Rimland theory, the continental powers and the uh, sea powers, the conflict between the two powers all happened in the Rimlands, in the coastal zones. And the Korean War in the Korean Peninsula was such a war, the Vietnam War as well, and China, the, in its coastal areas, there were a lot of invasions against China. So he gave a lot of examples on the th Rimland theory. And Spikeman went on to say, those who rule the Rimlands will rule Eurasia, and whoever rules Eurasia will be in charge of the fate of the world. So this is uh, the theory of Spikeman. And Korea, Korean Peninsula, and other Rimlands suddenly became very important areas because of Spikeman's theory. So on, let's now look at some actual war examples. We had the Russo-Japanese War, and that was a fight between the continental power Russia versus the sea powers Japan and the US and the UK. And in the sea powers, along with Japan, the US and UK were uh, included also. So there was an agreement among the three countries. And also they formed an alliance because they wanted to stop the so southward movement of Russia. And that is the background of the Anglo-Japanese alliance. So I won't go into the details, but this Russo-Japanese war was a representative example of the fight between the continental versus maritime powers particularly the US and the UK did not want Russia going into Japan or to the Korean Peninsula. So they were very wary and concerned about that possibility. And so the US and the UK as maritime uh, powers needed to protect the seas, the Pacific and the Atlantic. 
And for Russia, they wanted to go out into the seas to become a global hegemon. That was probably their, its intention at that time. So the basic idea, that basic idea, I don't think has changed much in the present day. These days, in middle and high schools in Korea, well, this uh, caricature is featured in the history books here in Korea. On the leftmost, the leftmost person is, represents Russia, and uh, Japan, the Japanese person, is holding the sword, and the person pushing Japan forward is the UK, the British, and then the US. Is has his hands in the pocket and is just watching. And this is a very popular caricature. And what's missing here? It's Korea at that time because South Korea at that time was very a weak country. That's why it was not included in this uh, cartoon. So. The UK and the US left to the hands of the Japanese the fate of the Korean Peninsula. And there was the treaty, unfair treaty between uh, Korea and Japan, which led to the eventual colonization of Korea. Next, let's try to look at the uh, Korean War seen from the geopolitical perspective. One uh, important example will be the Pacific War. So this was a fight between the US and Japan. Uh, normally, if you're uh, maritime powers, you will be on the same side. But in this case, both the US and Japan were maritime powers, but they were fighting each other during the Pacific War because Japan had become a rimland, and it wanted to build a huge Japanese empire in all of the rimland or coastal areas that it had gone into. So the Korean Peninsula, Manchuria, a third of China, Taiwan, and Southeast Asia. In these regions, Japan was hoping to establish the Japanese empire, and the U.S. Wanted to stop Japan from using this rimland area to expand its territory. And Russia and China, through these rimland areas, trying to go to the Pacific area, uh, Japan was stopping that movement or attempt by Japan, uh, excuse me, by China. So the Soviet Union at the time, China, US, the UK, they came together. Uh, and defeated Japan, which had become a remnant area. And the result of that is the pacifist constitution. And that is one uh, perspective on the pacifist constitution, uh, trying to apply the geopolitics of that times to try to interpret the uh, results. The of the historical events at that time. So that's one way to look at the pacifist constitution and how it came about, seen from the geopolitical perspective. So if Japan did not maintain uh, armed forces, the geopolitical risks would be reduced. So in that respect, as I mentioned earlier, even if we see from the geopolitical pers perspective also, the pacifist constitution of Japan has to be maintained, and that's a must. If we look at the example of the Korean War also, this was a fight between South Korea, the US, and the Allied States. Those would, these countries would comprise the maritime powers versus the continental powers, which are North Korea, China, and Soviet Union. And in fact, the Korean War led to dividing the Korean Peninsula. Both the continental powers and the maritime powers divided up the Korean Peninsula. So the maritime powers took South Korea, the continental powers took North Korea. 
And that is the result of the Korean War. So the current DMZ has become a buffer. And geopolitically, if we try to interpret that, DMZ is a buffer zone between the continental and maritime powers, and it has become a peace zone. And so if we continue to uphold and protect the DMZ, then we may have eventual peace on the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia, or at least maintain the peace in this region. And uh, my conclusion is, and I am talking from a Korean's perspective, because I'm Korean now, uh, I think it's important for us to overcome the curse of geopolitics. We have to ensure that the Korean Peninsula overcomes the curse of geopolitics. We need to liberate the Korean Peninsula from this curse. And that is the calling of all of the South Koreans and as well as that of the countries that are close or related to South Korea. And for that, we need to maintain the pacifist constitution of Japan and maintain the DMZ as a buffer zone. And so I reach a very simple conclusion, but I do want to look at this from a very broad perspective, that of historical flow. And my personal view is that in the border area between China and North Korea, if we were to form the second DMZ, then that's going to contribute to peace on the Korean Peninsula. And also Japan, because it is considered as a rimland area, so Japan as a rimland area and the two Koreas can be put together as a single buffer zone. And we may expect that kind of a result eventually. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hosaka Yuji. I'm sure that there are many more things that you want to share with us, but thank you very much for summarizing your presentation well and keeping to your time limit. Last but not least, we'd like to invite our panelists from Gangwon National University, Professor Park Yong Suk. And I really apologize beforehand, but please be very brief with your discussion. And I apologize again for the short time. Hello, good afternoon. I am Park Yong Suk, professor at Kangwon National University. I have a brief presentation prepared on the Japanese Constitution and Article 9. The Japanese Constitution was went into effect in 1947. It has never been amended. So it is the longest existing uh, Japanese Constitution in its original form. So the basic principles are the respect for basic human rights and popular sovereignty as well as pacifism. So the hot issue these days is the pacifism policy under the Japanese constitution. And that's part of the preamble as well as Article 9. So the fact that they will not begin war or resolution against war and reaffirmation of the right to live in peace. And it, in Article 9, Section 1, it talks about renouncing war. In Section 2, it talks about non-armament. And that is also part of South Korean constitution. But our constitution is not called a peace constitution. It's because a Japanese constitution has this very strong section that renounces war and on non-armament. That is why we call this a pacifist constitution in the case of Japan. So what is the significance of Article 9 in particular? In fact, in interpreting the Constitution, we have to look at the different 
clauses, and we can have literal translations, but then we also have to look at the background of the legislation processes, which is also an important element of the interpretation. We also have to look at whether the basic principles of the constitutions have changed to date. What is the uh, international political situation at that time? So we have to look at both the internal and external elements in trying to interpret the constitution. In the early stages, most of the scholars uh, in Japan who studied the Constitution said that the Article 9 signifies renouncing war, disarmament, right of and uh, renouncing right of belligerency and others. However, it's, the Supreme Court doesn't always actively accept these con uh, conventional views among the scholars. And so, uh, so sometimes the Supreme Court would rule in favor of uh, the, respecting the perce perception or opinions of the cabinet, for example. So you will see that the Japanese constitution has a lot of different dimensions. So from the Allied forces perspectives, it can be interpreted from the perspective of uh, disarming a militarist um, armed forces or banning war of aggression and others. So Article 9 sometimes um, plays that role. And so it's called a lightning rod constitution as a result. And the Japanese conservative uh, forces also are saying that this is uh, a forced constitution, which is a stumbling block to Japan having military capability. So what area in particular should Korea and other Asian countries take note in particular in the Japanese constitution? And so uh, the Article 9 in particular has the important nature of a resolution uh, against war against the, Jap uh, the Asian countries and the Asian people. And so if you look at the preamble, you will see that there is resolution against beginning any war and prevention of any interference or invasion of the sovereignty of other countries. So that is the gist, the most important uh, element of the preamble. And so this pledge, this resolution, uh, and being written down in and of itself will be meaningful. However, having demilitarized pacifism w through this basic principle it ha means that it has great significance. So who has ga given this proposal? And there are many different perceptions here, but Prime Minister Sidehara Gijuro uh, had proposed this Article 9 according to some theory. And there are those who say that it was uh, General MacArthur who first presented or suggested Article Now. But anyhow, whatever the true story may be, what's important is that the Article 9 exists and we can see the pers perspective that this was an attempt to secure the safety of Asian countries from Japan, possibility of future Japanese aggression. And so there is this a strong element included in Article 9. And so in the case of uh, the Allied forces, for example, this was from the emperor's uh, perspective and, and MacArthur's and other allied countries' perspective, through Article 9, it was a measure to protect the Asian region from uh, Japan. So now let's look at the meaning of peace, living in peace. What does this mean according to the Japanese constitution? If you look at the preamble of the constitution, it says, we desire to occupy an honored place in an international society, striving for the preservation of peace and the banishment of tyranny and slavery, oppression and intolerance for all times from the earth. So peace, according to the JC, doesn't mean just no war. It's not a passive form of peace. So tyranny, slavery, or oppression and intolerance, all of these things being completely banished from the earth. That is the definition of peace according to JC. So if that's the case, 
It is actually linked directly with the ideology of nonviolence. So peace, according to JC, is linked to the issues of poverty, hunger, oppression, discrimination, marginalization, and, and other violence that stems from social structures. And so we can expand the definition to include all of the social structure-based violence uh, under the definition of peace. And some people may say that humans have the instinct to fight, to struggle. And so wars, we are bound to have wars throughout human history, according to some people. However, there is this several statement on violence that was adopted, which says that uh, human wars, it's not a result of human instinct to fight, but rather social systems have enabled this. And so we can use the or improve the social systems to ensure that such fight and struggles will not, will not occur in the future. Absolute pacifism and the formation of self-defense forces has led to a change to this definition. And as I mentioned earlier, under the Abe administration, there may have been some attempts to do away with this pacifism. And so this pacifist constitution, particularly Article 9, is it now just an empty promise? If so, should we allow the amendment of the constitution of Japan? But in fact, as seen from the legislative perspective, the core essence of the constitution remains. And so any future revisions or amendments will still have a lot of uh, hindrances and limitations because the basic pillars of the Constitution still remain, such as morality and the intellect of the public. And of course, there's a possibility that the pacifist Constitution will be very burdensome for the Japanese people. However, the peace, according to the JC, doesn't just mean the end of war. Again, it includes the concepts of stopping or banishing tyranny, slavery, oppression, and intolerance as well. And so the Japanese people, if they have this clear understanding of the significance of peace in JC, particularly Article 9, then we will be able to find ways to actually realize this peace in our daily lives in reality thank you very much for your interpretation and presentation on the japanese constitution unfortunately i was not able to give you more time but we do appreciate your presentation anyhow so we've listened to the uh four uh, the six speakers and panelists we have a few minutes uh, remaining all the way from japan we have someone connected looking at the Korean Peninsula issues and listening to the presentations. We have Mr. Akiba Tadatoshi who gave a video presentation earlier. Our former uh, mayor of Hiroshima wanted to take a moment to share with you on the efforts to fight against uh, nuclear weapons in Korea. Thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you very much for staying until the end of the program. We are short on time, so could you be brief? Maybe take up about three minutes of time when you speak, and then we will try to meet with you next time again. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for organizing this you know, wonderful uh, meeting for creating peace. And I'm glad to be part of it. And, and I'm glad that uh, all of you value uh, the pacifism, you know, clause in the Japanese constitution. And there is one thing I would like to sort of uh, offer as something that we should consider to glue all the comments that uh, you have so wonderfully, you know, offered us. That is the concept of the Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone. That is the idea consisting of six countries. Um, so making promises. Now, three core countries, that is 
DPRK, ROK, and Japan um, pledge that, that, that they will not have nuclear weapons. And three out, outer countries, that is Russia, China, and the United States, assure that they will not attack the three core countries with nuclear weapons. That's negative security assurances that uh, they give. If such a treaty is concluded, or if a process starts involving these six countries, and uh, you know, six countries trying to talk to each other, including DPRK, that would actually involve Japan in a natural and peaceful way. And that would enlighten many Japanese who do not necessarily understand the important role that Japan could and should play. And also, I, I think that will give a clear message um, from the foreign sort of uh, sources to the Japanese government and, uh, you know, rectify sort of its thinking away from, you know, simply second guessing American uh, intentions and following it. So, you know, I could go into details, but Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone, um, I believe is one of a good possibilities that uh, we should uh, consider seriously and we should let people of these six countries know that such a good idea exists and uh, you know, so that uh, they, the people can you know, support it and, and uh, you know, move the whole sort of discussion forward. Okay, thank you very much. I guess I took more than three minutes, but anyway. <laughs> no, it's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much for connecting from far away to participate in this session. Once again, I apologize for not being able to give you ample time, and we look forward to meeting you in other forums and other sessions in the future. But again, we ho we're hoping for a, a speedy resolution to the peace issue so that we don't have to talk about this issue all the time. But anyhow, I do believe that we will get a chance to meet again. And Professor Kim Jae-han. Is Professor Kim? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. I wasn't able to give you enough time and I apologize. So I wanted to spare with you, uh, spare you a couple of minutes if you have anything that you would like to share. Oh, well, there isn't uh, well anything that I, uh, any burning comment right now, but I would like to say that the, these days, uh, I hope that uh, it's important to gather all of these ideas and concepts together and uh, find a way to organize our thoughts and views. Uh, we have different views in both Korea as well as Japan, and I believe that it would be great if we can have further exchanges with all of these uh, uh, pro prominent speakers with different views to make the Peace Forum all the more effective and productive. Yes, we were trying to deal with uh, two different topics and uh, there were many limitations in the process but thank you very much for that suggestion and as uh, we hold these peace forums uh, we'll make sure that that is the case that we can continue on with the exchange we had speakers and panelists uh, here today and if we check the time I think that I can offer just about a minute or two uh, about a minute for our speakers to provide uh, us with their concluding remarks yes just briefly a couple of comments to conclude uh, the order in East Asia right now I think is at a fork in the road uh, we need to make sure that we select the right direction and if not the people of East Asia uh, may witness and experience some very unfortunate events and incidents 
the pacifist uh, constitution of Japan, I want to once again emphasize, is a key factor here. And uh, the small nation theory that's implied in this peace constitution was something that I already elaborated on in my presentation, but it's about uh, turning our backs on hegemony, and it's the same case for Japan. U.S., the U.S. and China are currently vying for hegemony right now in East Asia. And I believe that this can lead to some very destructive results, and we need to prevent that from happening. And uh, Japan needs to set the right direction to prevent that. And uh, the basic foundation to have a Japan set the right direction would be Article 9 of uh, the Pacifist Constitution. And I want to once again reiterate uh, that this constitution will play a critical role in East Asia to make sure that it's not a world of hegemony, but a world of coexistence and harmony. This order is uh, most needed right now in East Asia, and if we do see a collapse of such order, there will be no longer pacifism and no longer the smaller, small nation theory or policy. And in creating order in East Asia, what's important now and in the future is uh, the nuclear issue of the North. This is another paramount factor uh, to instill peace on the Korean Peninsula. And I want to say that the foundation here is once again the pacific constitution. As was mentioned in my presentation, Japan needs to be actively involved in this process. And they need to engage in this process uh, to solve the issues with DPRK. Of course, they have the kidnapping issues, and they still need to normalize relations. And the leaders of Japan has uh, staged their will to engage in unconditional dialogue with the North Korean leader, uh, the same case for Prime Minister Suga. Well, we need to make uh, these attempts into a reality. We need to have them be more effective and more active in the process, and it's about having dialogue with DPRK. And the overall Korean peace process should also engage Japan to have it play a positive role. And uh, once again, the pacifist constitution will enable that. And that is why I want to say that the meaning that this constitution has is gr greatly significant. Yes, thank you very much. And I apologize for not giving, giving you enough time. Um, I would like to apologize. Professor Hosaka Yuji. Yes. If you look at the move for amendment of the constitution within Japan, well, Article 9. South Koreans may think that there has been an all-out revision of Article 9, but uh, the discussions within the Liberal Democratic Party is that sections 1 and 2 of Article 9, so that is renunciation of war and the renunciation of belligerent, belligerency or the right to belligerency. So the discussion is on these two sections. And there's also the talk of a possible third section. So in section 3, it said it will be about the role of the self-defense force. Uh, right now, according to the current constitution, the self-defense force itself is unconstitutional. But as a self-defense force, the, at least the self-defense force should be allowed. So that is the kind of discussion that is going on uh, within the party right now. And there is a coalition party uh, that is also participating in this discussion. So Article 9 
probably will not be easily amended because there is some opposition even among the different political parties. But the problem is that they're, may, they're trying to form a coalition government. And if this coalition government is successful and then there's another opposition parties such as, uh, that are far right, so and if they participate in this coalition, then it may be a dangerous situation. So there's a possibility. Also, in fact, within Japan, there are the geopolitical issues involving the political parties within Japan as well. So I just wanted to share with you this background information. Thank you so much. Thank you to our speakers, our panelists. Again, I apologize for the short time and some glitches that I've committed during my moderation today. I apologize for that as well. And to the audience also, my apologies. Today, over two hours, we looked at the Japanese pacifist constitution and the value of DMZ. So though we engaged in very good discussions, the remnant of the Korean War is the DMZ. And the remnant of the Second World War is the pacifist constitution of Japan. And we now have to ensure that these remnants will not remain as remnants of the past, but be uh, new values for the future, contribute to creating new values going forward. So I think our session was very meaningful in that respect. We have to learn from the past history of war to ensure that there will be no arms race and uh, never again war in Northeast Asia and to have hope for peace on the Korean Peninsula. And if we are able to share in that thought, then I believe our session uh, will be a very successful one. So uh, the effort to oppose nuclear weapons, oppose wars, and also to share in common values among the peoples of Northeast Asia, thereby contributing to peaceful coexistence in this region. We are dreaming of that time when this will be a reality. And with that, I would like to conclude this session. Thank you so much for your participation. We are at a crossroads in human civilization, and so I wish you great health at this important time. Thank you very much.